The purpose of our session today is to discuss the uh, pandemic influenza planning and response uh, specifically for the Purchase region, which is the eight counties of the Jackson Purchase. We have a number of speakers and I will just launch right on into the presentation. Um, our first speaker uh, is by trade a pediatrician. He told me earlier he did not want me to, to spend the entire time going through his entire curriculum vitae, but I will assure you that it is impressive. Uh, among his uh, previous uh, responsibilities, he has been the medical director of the Louisville Jefferson County uh, Department of Health and the director of the Louisville Jefferson County Department of Public Health. He's currently serving as our state epidemiologist with the Kentucky Department of Public Health, Dr. Craig Humbaugh. Dr. Humbaugh. driving for me, Kathy? All right, great, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Charlie. Appreciate that kind introduction, and it's great to be here. I thank uh, both the Marshall County Health Department and the Purchase District Health Department for inviting me to be here today on behalf of our Commissioner for Public Health in Kentucky, Dr. William Hacker. Um, I think this is, uh, your participation here today is evidence of how important you believe this topic is. Uh, to this community and hopefully at the end of the presentation um, you will, um, I can uh, convince you that uh, this type of a pandemic should it affect the U.S. will in fact um, affect all sectors of society and that communities, individual communities will need to be very self-sufficient because it's going to be a global type of a uh, an epidemic, so to speak, then um, everybody may be affected and there's a likelihood that there won't be a lot of outside help. So hopefully you'll get those messages today. Let me go back to December of 2005 when um, Dr. Hacker and I were invited as the two representatives from Kentucky to um, Washington, D.C. to a meeting that Secretary Levitt and Secretary Chertoff from Health and Human Services and Office of Homeland Security um, put on about pandemic flu. And what was interesting about the meeting was that uh, normally uh, the secretaries get up there and they say their little piece um, and it's like 10 minutes and then the rest of the people who work for them conduct the rest of the meeting and they go off and do their other stuff with the big wigs in Washington. But at this particular meeting, Secretary Levitt actually stayed there for the entire six hours moderated the meeting, facilitated it, answered questions very deftly, and it was obvious to Dr. Hacker and to me that he knew what he was talking about and respected this as a very real threat possibility here for the United States. And he charged us at that meeting to go back to all the states and to hold a pandemic summit, and we did that here in Kentucky in um, January of this year, and we had um, one of our speakers was uh, Dr. Julie Gerberdeen, who's head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and then at that summit, we actually asked our local health departments across the state to please um, conduct their own pandemic summits to inform and engage the community and get them started talking about this, uh, this possibility and what they would do if this were to occur. So um, at this particular summit, um, Secretary, that I'm talking about Washington, D.C., Secretary Levitt said that the pandemic is a local crisis worldwide, and I think that that is a really good phrase. Uh, the former Speaker of the House, Tiff O'Neill, said all politics are local, but I think all disasters are local, and since they strike us here at a local level, we have to learn how to deal with them here. And I know you all know that because I see so many partners uh, across this community, those who are in the health sector, but also those who are traditional first responders. Um, the first part of my talk is really going to be uh, about science, and I'm going to try to get the science out of the way first, talk about what exactly is the flu, what is a pandemic, how is that different from the bird flu that everyone talks about. So 
The flu, I think you all know about seasonal influenza. It's a virus. It, it occurs in mammals and man and others. Uh, it affects us every year, especially during the winter when we're inside and we're in very close proximity to each other. In humans, it can cause fever, cause headache, muscle aches, cough, um, even death in some cases, you can suffer from the complications of influenza can be quite serious. So how is uh, flu spread normally? And again, I think most of you know this, but flu is spread from tiny little droplets that are expelled when someone who is infected um, either coughs or sneezes or sings uh, and those kinds of things. And these little droplets then go out into the air and somebody who's not infected can breathe those in if they're in proximity to the infected person and those droplets are expelled. The other way to get the flu is that these droplets from the infected person land on a surface and then the person who's not infected touches that surface and then puts his or her hands in his or her mouth or nose and that's more common than we think it is and so that's why washing your hands is a very important method to prevent the spread of influenza. The incubation period is the period from the time when you're infected to the time when you actually begin to show symptoms. So in the case of the flu virus, it's actually a relatively short period of time. It's just one to four days. There are two types of flu. There's type A, and that's usually the more serious type of flu. And that's the type that can cause pandemics and the mainly the one we're going to be concerned about today. There's also a type B. And every year when you get a flu shot, there are actually two different type A strains and one type B strain in that shot. And though we can talk about that, but those change from year to year because there are minor changes in the virus each year. And that's why it's necessary to have a new flu shot every year. I wanted to make it clear the difference between an epidemic and pandemic because we're banding around this word pandemic, but what does it actually really mean? Well, to an epidemiologist, an epidemic is simply we're having more cases or we're seeing more cases of such and such an illness than we normally do. So that to us is an epidemic. If we had one case of smallpox in this country, it would be an epidemic to an epidemiologist because we haven't seen any here since 1949. Um, so ju that's just to give you an example. So normally during the winter flu season, we have a flu epidemic every year or a seasonal epidemic because we don't see much flu during the summer. But during the winter, we have much more cases than usual. So for an epidemiologist, that's an epidemic. A pandemic is really a global epidemic. It's a case when no one has immunity to a particular disease or a particular virus. So that's the difference. It's just an epidemic on a larger scale. And we talked about the fact that there are um, some connections between seasonal influenza and uh, pandemic influenza. And I won't dwell on those, but the main thing that I'll say is remember to get your flu shot each year. But the lessons that we learn, for instance, when we have flu shortage, flu vaccine shortages can help us in dealing better, I think, with a pandemic. So we can turn those negatives that we sometimes see um, into positives. So what about seasonal influenza? How bad does it really affect us in the United States and globally each year? Well, globally, a quarter of a million to a half a million people die of flu each year, either from the flu itself or for, from complications like bacterial infections that attack um, when someone has the flu. In the U.S., deaths are estimated to be about 36,000 during a normal flu season and there are over 200,000 hospitalizations and it has quite a bit of economic impact as you can see on the slide. A pandemic would even have more impact both um, from a health standpoint and an economic standpoint and we'll talk about that in one of the future slides. I want to emphasize that again the way the virus works the flu virus is that it's a very changeable virus and it changes that coating those little spikes that are on the outside of the virus. Those change from year to year. Sometimes um, 
some seasons they're different from other seasons. Sometimes there's a major change, and when that major change happens, again, that's a pandemic. How does that happen? Well, sometimes the bird flu or bird influenza can change and spread directly to a human, or that particular bird flu could get into a mixing vessel, and a pig is a common one, and so the human strain of flu goes into the pig, and the pig is simultaneously infected with the bird strain, the genetics of those mix and you come out with a new strain and that's the worry that at some point uh, that uh, strain might become a pandemic strain. History tells us that we've had about three pandemics in the last 100 years. We don't have a crystal ball, we don't know when it's going to happen again, but it behooves us to be ready for this type of an eventuality. It happened in 1918, 1957, and 1968. In 1918 and 1917, it was a pretty virulent strain. In other words, pretty, it was pretty severe. We still had more deaths than usual in 68, but we don't hear a lot about that because the strain wasn't quite as virulent as it was in 1918. And there's no way to predict how virulent the next strain of pandemic flu will be. What about this uh, virus that everybody's been hearing about with bird flu that started in Southeast Asia and now has spread to many countries around the world? Again, there is a possibility that this virus could at some point mutate and become transmissible human to human. At this point, we're not seeing that. In fact, at this point, we don't even see H5N1 here in the United States. Um, anywhere, either in poultry or birds or in, um, in humans. Um, and some of our other speakers may talk specifically about the surveillance that's being done on birds, especially on both of our coasts, looking at maybe migratory waterfowl that might be coming from other countries that might bring this uh, particular virus to us. But until it mutates human to human, then we won't have the final pandemic strain. And hopefully this will not become the next pandemic, but we don't know that, and that's why there's so much interest now, because it's thought that there's certainly a possibility that this could mutate human to human. The humans that have been infected overseas have gotten um, the virus directly from a, some domestic poultry, it's felt, and uh, that's because they live very close to their birds and their livestock. Um, in other countries, and so there's been some direct transmission, but as of this point, there's no human-to-human -human transmission. What kinds of effects could it possibly have on the United States as a whole, and then we'll talk about the state and communities. And this is actually from an article um, in the 1999 Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal, and really this talks about the possibility of when we prepare for the worst but hope for the best. And these are some of the numbers that we could see, again, depending on how virulent the strain is. So 3,000 to 7,000 deaths, 21,000 hospitalizations, a million outpatient visits. Are we prepared for this type of an eventuality, for this type of a um, tax on our healthcare system? Economically, um, it would also not be necessarily a walk in the park because um, we have um, quite a few industry, or let's, let me talk to you about a little bit about the um, chicken industry or poultry industry here in Kentucky. We're the eighth largest state in broiler production and we produce um, over 200 million broilers per year and we have 400 million laying hens. And so this would have quite an impact on our agricultural economy, as well as, of course, businesses who people would be out of work, how would they continue their operations. So all that would affect uh, and cause a major economic impact here in Kentucky, or could cause the major economic impact. When planning for a pandemic flu, what are the, some of the assumptions that we make? Well, I hope I've made it clear that unfortunately pandemic flu is not preventable. Um, 
that we all are susceptible to a new pandemic strain and a universal susceptibility or a universal threat. Um, the pandemic is thought to come in waves. Again, this is based on history and infectious diseases in general, that it might affect a community for, for instance, six to eight weeks, and then that might die off or die down, and then it might come again, maybe even next flu season for six to eight weeks. Um, and there can be some fairly high clinical attack rates, especially among children, up to 40%. I, um, let me explain this slide. On the x-axis to the my far right, your far left, you see the specific death rate. And along the bottom is the age. And I want you to look specifically at the 1918 or solid line here. And that's what happened with the death rate during a pandemic in 1918. And you can see right here, I want you to look at this part of the curve. What that means is there was an increase in the numbers of deaths in people who are young adults and middle-aged adults. And that as compared to a normal or intra-pandemic flu year, which is 1911 through 1917, that's the dotted line, you see that the death rates were higher in very young children or in the elderly. So again, we have to be prepared for this may attack people great, and we don't know why that was, but it may have a greater attack rate and greater mortality or death rate in folks who are in the prime of their lives and the folks that keep our infrastructure of society going. We have to assume that Half of those who are ill are likely to seek outpatient care. Again, that there could be some variation in how virulent this virus is, um, that there is going to be a greater demand for um, medical services that might exceed supply. In this day and age, uh, we expect to go to the doctor and we expect to be cured from whatever uh, ails us. In 1918, it was much more of people stayed home. Um, they didn't necessarily go to the hospital or to the doctor when they were ill. So we have a different mindset now, so it's going to be even harder probably on our medical system because our medical system has gotten better. Um, and of course, community services could be altered and the entire community infrastructure be threatened. For instance, what would happen if most of the utility workers had to stay home? Uh, how could we keep our lights on? Would our garbage be collected? Those kinds of issues. And again, that's why we're here talking today. So what are some of the challenges that we face in preparing for a pandemic? And one of the challenges is that until we have that final virus strain, the one that's transmissible human to human, we really don't know the epidemiology that we talked about in a couple of slides. We don't know if it will primarily affect certain age groups or how communicable it will be. So there's no way of knowing that. Another thing is we don't, we're not able to really know if viral, antiviral drugs will be effective in treatment until we, that strain has mutated. And until we have that final strain of pandemic, it's going to be difficult to produce a vaccine. So it may be 6 to 12 months before a vaccine gets produced against a new strain of influenza. And these are some of the many, many tough challenges that we have and as possibilities in dealing with this. So, you know, if we can't prevent this, why plan for it? Um, well, somebody once said, if you are failing to plan, you're planning to fail. We certainly don't want to do that. Um, and our goal is to try to prevent as much illness and death as possible and to preserve a community infrastructure during a critical time. And I think the planning is, is smart to do, if, even if this didn't happen next week, next month, next year, um, at some point in the future, we may be um, faced with some type of communicable disease threat. And a lot of the planning that we do for a pandemic, even though it's the sexy hot topic now, applies to any type of communicable disease threat. So that's why it's important to, to do that. And again, all sectors must participate in the planning because all sectors will be affected. So let's talk about some of the key components of 
pandemic planning, and you have to have a road map of where you're going in order to get there. Um, one of my favorite bumper stickers is, I may, be, I may be lost, but I'm making record time. Okay, we certainly don't want to do that. We want to have the road map. We want to know exactly where our destination is, and these are some of the things we can start to attack um, here at the local level. Things like surveillance systems, and when I say surveillance systems, the law enforcement people are thinking probably one thing, but I'm thinking of medical surveillance, which is again looking at where is that first case going to hit, watching and waiting for the first case of any type of communicable disease, but today we're talking about pandemic flu. Um, quarantine and isolation procedures, we'll talk a little bit about that, talk about some surge capacity, which is, means how can hospitals provide extra staffed beds or other places in the community to provide those. And uh, we'll also talk about priority groups because if there are limited numbers of vaccine and limited numbers of antivirals, then who's gonna get the first ones that come to your community? And again, that needs to be something that your community thinks of beforehand. I want to talk next about um, the different levels of response and integrating these levels of response. And I'm going to start with the big picture. Um, I'm not really going to talk about the international, but I think you all know that the World Health Organization, from you watching the news, is doing a lot of surveillance, of, especially of avian influenza in countries throughout the world. Um, the national plan, uh, again, was just unveiled in November of last year. The state plan has been something Kentucky's been working on since 2003, really before it became fashionable. And then we'll talk about local plans and things that individuals and families can do. So let's start with the federal government's plan and talk about some of the key elements there. They're looking at this from the big picture, thinking that everyone may be infected. What can they do as the federal government? Well, one thing that they're trying to do is to expand the production of current vaccine. So, you know, we've had trouble in the last four or five years, even getting seasonal influenza, sometimes on a timely basis for our vaccine. So the idea is to try to make that process smoother. The other thing that they're looking into is doing research to make a uh, vaccine in a different way. Manufacturers make it now based uh, in eggs. So they use eggs, which is kind of ironic because the bird flu affects chickens, right? And so we may not have eggs to make the vaccine. Um, and what we need to do is move to a more modern or cell-based um, method of manufacturing vaccine, but many experts think that that's at least 10 years away. But that would allow us, once we have a virus, to make a vaccine relatively quickly as opposed to our old-fashioned egg-based method. So that's one, the, a couple things the federal government is doing. In addition, um, they're looking at how do we stretch what vaccine we have farther. And you can do that by adding things like adjuvants or possibly by giving it a different method. In other words, a smaller amount might be a, more effective given a different route. And so the federal government is looking at that too. And in addition, they've developed many checklists for people in local communities on how to start planning. So they have a checklist for faith-based communities and schools and businesses. And you can find that on their website, which is www.pandemicflu.gov. And of course, all these partners are participating in, the, uh, in our response. Let's see. Keep going if you would. What about all ha hazards planning approach to con in Kentucky? Well, I said we've had a, we've had a uh, plan for quite some time, and this plan is part of a greater disaster plan. It needs to be flexible, it has to be exercised, and again, all of our tr traditional first responders know those things. It doesn't do us any good to put it on the shelf, and I think, as I said before, this is kind of the ultimate plan, because if we can ex respond to a pandemic flu, then we can certainly respond to any type of communicable disease threat. 
I'm going to brag on us for a little while and tell you about what I think are some of Kentucky's strengths. One is we've had a plan for a while and we've been thinking about this for a while. Another is we're a fairly tightly knit small state. I think this is a strength. As my boss always says, if you stick around long enough, you get to meet all 40 million people. So um, if we don't meet other people and play well together, then we won't have a chance of successfully responding to any disaster, whether it be communicable disease or an earthquake uh, or radiation event or flood or tornado. Um, and that the other strength we have is that we're constantly having what my boss also calls pop quizzes. So we have to respond to um, the maybe inability of seasonal flu vaccine or to uh, the new threats of West Nile virus, the worries about SARS. We've even had monkeypox here in this district. Um, so all those things actually strengthen our ultimate communicable disease response and our ultimate com community response. And finally, I think uh, one of our other strengths is that we have such an active um, e-health or um, health technology um, systems here in Kentucky. Uh, we're one of the few states that has an e-health bill where we're able to transfer health information without many barriers from place to place and that helps during a disaster and then we have we're putting new technology to work with our health alert networks and uh, with other uh, video conferencing. So I think all those things help us to respond. These are some of our many uh, collaborative partners. What can we do and how can we respond to a pandemic influenza? And these are all things that are part of our state plan and hopefully will be part of your community plan as well. Well, first of all, uh, when there's a novel virus, the first thing may be to try to call bird flocks if it's coming from the avian flu side um, and to get rid of the avian flu so that it doesn't mutate human to human. Uh, second of all, when it begins, the quarantine and isolation may be the best way to try to at least delay the spread of this particular pandemic virus. And that means the few people who have it, try to keep them away from other folks. And if we have vaccine or viral, antiviral medicines that are effective, then the people they've come in contact, try to give them vaccine or give antivirals to those folks so that they won't come down with the illness, the people have been exposed to it and then spread it to others. But at some point, most experts think that that probably that strategy is just going to delay it, but it's not going to completely prevent a pandemic flu. And the reason is because we're a global society. We move around from here to there and everywhere, and it's difficult to know who's been exposed and who now has the potential of, um, of getting flu and then exposing others. So at some point, um, probably we can delay it but not prevent it totally. And at that point, the idea is to um, begin what they call in CDC, it's a fancy term they've developed called social distancing. And it simply means the old-fashioned public health measures that you use um, before in the old days, which is stay away from other people if you're sick. Don't go to work when you're sick. Wash your hands just like your mama told you. Those kinds of things um, are going to be really the backbone of the response if we do have a major type of a pandemic here in the United States. Let's talk about some of the few things that are um, in the plan. One is surge capacity. And for those of you who are not hospital or EMS folks, surge capacity simply means how many extra staffed beds do we have. And most hospitals don't have a lot of those because of the econo today's economic situation. Um, most want to run as full to capacity as they possibly can. Um, and, and we understand that. But in the case of some type of a communicable disease epidemic like this, there's going to be a need for more beds and you're going to have a need for more people to staff those beds and there's going to be a need for volunteer people. And for instance, during 1918, uh, veterinarians and dentists and pharmacists and many other people stepped up to the plate to help out with patient care. Um, the other thing is, does all this type of thing need to be done at, in a hospital setting or can it be done in some other type of a setting? In 1918, gymnasiums were set up where people were taken care of. 
What's thought today is that CDC may recommend what's called sheltering at home, or people staying at home and taking care of their loved ones at home. And that way, there's less possibility of spreading the virus. But if that's recommended, then how does your community get food and supplies to these people who are staying at home trying not to infect other people? Um, and that's a big issue, especially in rural communities when there's long distance between um, the grocery store and home or some other important place and home. Um, I was privileged to be part of the uh, HRSA Regional meeting um, that occurred just before I came, and you guys are in HRSA Region 1 here um, in the Western Kentucky, and I can see that you have a really active group, and this group is composed of, for those of you who don't know, hospital folks, federally qualified health centers, mental health, local health departments, um, and I'm probably forgetting other people, EMS. Um, all of who sit around the table once a month and talk about um, how do we improve our response, our healthcare response, just to these issues. And so I think this is a very important group, and uh, thank you for being such an active group. What about isolation and quarantine? I think I mentioned a little bit about this, but I want to tell you that there's a Kentucky law that gives very broad power to my boss, the Commissioner for Public Health, to pretty much do what he wants to, to quote, adopt and enforce, quote, rules and regulations to prevent the spread of disease. The problem is we haven't really used this regulation for a very, very long time because we haven't quarantined people routinely probably since the 1940s with the exception of tuberculosis and we still occasionally do that here in this state. But this law hasn't been very well tested and so that's part of the problem. The question is if the health officer of the county were to issue such a quarantine order, would law enforcement um, would they uphold that? Would they enforce that? Um, and you know, and how would that happen? And again, these are things that you need to think about beforehand. And again, not easy. I've talked a little bit about antivirals. Tamiflu and other antiviral medications have gotten a lot of attention. The problem is we don't know how effective they will be, if at all, during an actual pandemic. They could be effective, they might not be. It's probably good not to put all of our eggs into one basket, no pun intended. Um, but if we have some antivirals and they do work, that's fine, but that can't be our entire plan is to just to stockpile a bunch of medicines because they may not be effective. And I think I talked about the fact that we probably won't be able to ex expect any um, vaccine for the first six to 12 months, and then it'll come in fits and starts and trickles. And so um, the communities need to decide, and there's guidance from the federal level and from the state level about what those priority groups probably should be. But it's gonna be tough for communities to decide, should our youngest children get it? Should our elderly citizens who are most vulnerable, should our elected leaders get it first so that they can continue to run government? Should our utility people get it first so that we can have uh, power and the things that we need? Should our transportation and food service people get it so we can eat? Uh, all you know, really big questions. Um, the federal government has recommended that healthcare workers be near the top of the priority list in most communities so that they can continue to man and staff uh, hospitals and other healthcare facilities uh, where the sick and disabled are coming in. And finally, risk communications. I think this is always important that everybody stay on the same page when there's so many different organizations and agencies in a community uh, working together on the same issue. It can often be a problem. Whenever we do an exercise, I know in Frankfurt, or we have a real event that involves the state uh, as a whole, communications is always one of our downfalls. It's always that big gap is, are we saying the same messages our partners are saying? Is it a clear message? Is it something that's easily understood by the public and by our other partners? And uh, th those are um, other roles. That are th that's important to get together and make sure that message is as one. Community planning is really just the same thing that I've talked about at the state, but at the local level, and hopefully 
Um, I've explained that fairly well. Um, this summit is obviously part of the process, but one of the challenges here today is finding ways to continue this interest uh, long after perhaps it's not become the hot topic of the day. Um, again, for any communicable disease. What about families and individuals? Again, I'm taking it down to the lowest level, and this is the most basic level, but perhaps the most important level. Families need to have disaster plans. What would you do if you're separated from your other family members? How do you expect to find them if you're separated and there's no method of communication? Do you have a plan for that? Do you have food and water for a few days in case of a disaster? And most importantly, the things we talked about, basic personal public health protection measures, washing your hands, coughing and sneezing into your elbow, staying at home when you're sick. Finally, let me wrap up with just some reminders. And again, I'm thinking mainly about Hurricane Katrina, but this could apply to other events. And I think it's important to remember these lessons learned and try to apply them to our planning here as we think about pandemic influenza. And it's hard, I don't want to be chicken little and say the sky is falling. At the same time, we want to make sure that people understand that this is certainly a threat for us at some point in the future pandemic. So one is, I think we learned that the public may not prepare, be prepared even though repeatedly warned. But I think part of our job is to continue to warn them to be, and get them prepared. Um, that real disasters can be worse than expected, that concerns of family members can override their people's jobs. So you have to make sure that your first responders um, in the health and safety community as well as fire and all your first responders are protected and taken care of early so, and that their family members are so that they can go out and do the jobs that they were meant to do. Um, and finally, communications and logistics are critical and impact may be both medical and economic. So my closing thoughts are that a pandemic doesn't appear uh, imminent this time. There's no reason to panic. But the idea here is to start and begin a community discussion, a community dialogue about how to become prepared uh, if this becomes a possibility. And uh, we think that one will happen again at some time. History tells us it will. The question is when that's going to happen. We don't know. But we do have time now to get prepared. If we wait until much later and we've already got a virus that's mutated, we may not nearly have as long to a time period to prepare for it. And finally, just that community that is prepared for a pandemic flu is prepared for any type of com communicable disease threat and will be stronger during uh, their response to any type of a disaster. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I think afterwards at the panel discussion, I'll take some questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Humball. Uh, and he said uh, a little later we'll have a panel discussion, have an opportunity. Just a reminder, if you have questions, if some of his presentation triggered some thoughts in your mind, jot that note down on a piece of paper somewhere and drop it in the basket when we, uh, well, you can do that now or when we take a break. Uh, let me refer you back to your purple packet again, just by way of information, kind of to touch on uh, Dr. Humboldt's theme there about uh, preparation and particularly family preparation. There's some materials in your packets that, that are intended just for that purpose. Uh, one of those things, for example, you see a little, looks like a little credit card. It's a fold out packet that has uh, several bits and pieces of information about uh, disasters of a variety. It's not specific just to pandemic flu, but it covers a number of topics. There are a number of information websites on there. Uh, there's information about uh, bioterrorism, uh, poison control hotline. Again, just common kinds of emergencies that arise um, and, and that you need uh, preparation for. There's a, 
a small piece in there on disaster plan information, again, meeting place, out of time contacts, how, for, how to get a hold of mom and dad or the kids or whatever. That information, it's oftentimes on your refrigerator at home and you're not at home and you don't remember those things. That's part of what that little, that little folding system is there for. So each one of those is in your packet and please feel free to, to try to utilize that. Likewise, there's one similar to that. It's a, you know, a red and white format that's uh, for you to clip out. Again, a family communications plan. Uh, same kind of information, contact names, neighborhood meeting place. Now, these are a little bit repetitious, but hopefully you're getting the message here that, as, as Dr. Humball said, this is not a, an imminent danger, but the better prepared we are, whether we're talking about floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, or, or a, a health event such as a pandemic uh, flu event, the better off we'll be in the way of response. Uh, there's also some checklists there uh, for individuals and families and businesses. Again, I don't try to go through all of those, but uh, be sure and take those with you when you leave today and, and make use of them. Okay, I think we're running pretty well close to schedule. Um, our next, actually, person to introduce is another one of our uh, community partners we work with very closely. who. Doug Wilson is the McCracken County Extension Agent for Agriculture and Natural Resources. Doug? Thank you, Charlie. You know, I noticed that when Charlie began the program, he talked about partnership and collaboration. And I hope everyone here is aware of the Extension offices in your county and throughout the state because we are one of your partners. Uh, I meet with Charlie and, and Kathy almost every month and Kent King our uh, emergency management director is here and I think we're doing a very good job in McCracken County and, and in the Purchase Counties in trying to be prepared but just want to remind you that you know we're all part of the puzzle and we all have a goal to protect and preserve our communities well actually Kathy contacted me about doing this part of the program and as a good extension person, you know, you try to find somebody better qualified than you. But uh, I haven't had Tony down in this part of the country in, in some time, and so I contacted uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Pescatore, our poultry specialist at UK, and asked him if he'd come down. I will tell you, now, he's been at UK 20 years. He came down from the great state of New Jersey. He doesn't have much accent. And occasionally he will say you all. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, Tony Pescatore. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I had a choice today. I could either speak at the Frankfurt pandemic meeting or this one, and I like this place better. <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit from the bird's view and the uh, poultry industry's view and it was touched on a little bit about how big the industry is in the state and poultry in the state of Kentucky is a 900 million dollar industry. It employs 7,000 people. There's 850 poultry farms in the state and there's thousands of backyard flocks. So even if it doesn't affect humans, birds are a big part of Kentucky. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit about being prepared. And the poultry industry supports the communities uh, responding and pan uh, planning for a pandemic. But one of the things that's kind of uh, getting a little dangerous is that the word pandemic in avian has become synonymous. You look at some websites and they don't distinguish it. Avian flu may not be the next big one. So when you do that, you, and we do this preparation, we need to make sure we aren't scaring people. I'm reminded because my 88-year-old aunt called me one day from New Jersey. She wanted to know about this bird thing. So I had talked to her a while, and I was trying to explain what was going on and that, and after about 20 minutes, I decided the best advice I could give her was, I told her that if there comes a point when you need to stop eating chickens, I'll call you. <laughs> so when you're doing these plantings, remember there's a lot of 88-year-old ants out there 
that don't need to be scared. And we also have a large industry we need to protect. Next slide. Avian influenza in the United States is not the same virus as the bird flu in Asia. We have some avian influenza that's normally in the country, but it's not that avian influenza. And we talked a little bit about how it's named, but they have the, the H and uh, the hemagglutin and uh, antigen with 15 or 16 types, depending on who you listen to, and nine subtypes. So there's all kinds of vari variations. But the one we worry about is the H5N1. That's what's the bird flu that's going around in Asia and other parts of the world. And this is what the little devil looks like. The HA is part of the uh, binding sites on, on the virus. The N is uh, the other binding site. And they have eight proteins in the uh, center of the organism. And it's those eight proteins that people start getting worried about when they talk about it changing. This vi the vi oh, go back. That virus will get mixed with other viruses and it'll pick up a piece of uh, protein from another virus. And if it picks up the right traits, it changes into what it can affect. Next one. The influenza is all over. If you look at it, there is a genetic reservoir in waterfowl, shorebirds, other aquatic birds. It's naturally occurring to have some resistance to it. And most of the uh, populations are in there. And occasionally, it will go in from there to other species. And that's what's happening now. You have a reserve that started in a goose, and you've moved it into poultry, you've mo and then having some movement into humans. Next one. And you look at that influenza, as, you, as we already said, we usually concentrate on H1, 2, or 3 with humans. Ducks have most of the, uh, the subtypes. Shorebirds have most of the su subtypes. And poultry is susceptible to a lot of these viruses. And what happens with these influenzas is the mammal and the birds have these flu, these flu viruses. They circulate in their respective populations. Horses, hogs, humans, birds are just a few of the species that are susceptible to flu viruses. Every once in a while, the, and generally, the flu viruses stay within their species. Every once in a while, they will come out of that species, and they will infect another. They will infect some, some other type of individual within that species, such as a duck going to a chicken, or it will go cross species. Like in right now, there's a swine flu that's out in uh, North Carolina that resides in hogs, but it can infect turkeys. And every occasion, it will change, and that's and it's always changing. Now, as already alluded to in the other talk, is that's why we have a different flu virus a vaccine every year, it's because there's a constant changing of those flu viruses. North America has always had some, some strains. They're circulating in our waterfowl, the wild birds, and the live bird markets. You're wondering what a live bird market is. You can imagine in the middle of New York City, there are actually markets where you can walk in, pick the chicken that you would like to eat for dinner that night, and someone will kill it for you. There's about 88 to 90 live bird markets in New York and New Jersey. And there has been some avian influenza that's circulated through that. But the H5N1 is not one of those strains that is in North America. As already was alluded to, it is not in North America. And the poultry companies and the poultry industry are concerned about all of these avian influenza strains, just not Asia, Asian bird flu. So it's not just that. The programs they have in place is to control normal AI as well as any special AIs like H5N1. Next. Some idea about Asia, Asian bird flu is that Right now, the, the uh, death count is up to about 109 people have died of Asian flu. And there's been about, about 200 known cases of it. And that's in a population of about 3.7 million people. It's not a virus that likes people very well. It's not contagious between people. Just recently, a study was, uh, in Nature was published. And it kind of explained why it's not very contagious in people. 
your normal your normal avian uh, your normal influenza viruses usually infect the upper respiratory tract. And when you just saw on the slide before, when you sneeze, that virus is coming out. Well, this avian H5N1 has a nice little trick of going deep into the respiratory area. So it's going very deep into the alve alveoli, into the ends of the lung, so it's not being expelled. Now, the bad part is once it's in there, it's in there. But it's not easily spread from person to person. And this study kind of give a, gave a kind of a reasoning why that occurs. People that, people that have been affected with the disease has had very close contact. Oop, I've got to go back to the next one. <laughs> people affected with the disease has had very close contact with sick birds. That was already alluded to. They either live with them, they butchered them, or they ate products from those sick birds. And a perfect example of this is a country called Azerbaijan. Small, poor country. All of the people that have died of avian influenza, the five to six people that have died, has been adolescent females who have been sent to pluck feathers off of the dead swans for resale. And they all got the virus, and, they all, and most of, a lot of them have died now that the ones that have gotten it are, are getting better over it. They're being treated. It's not something that's new, H5N1, is not new. We've known about it since 1997, and we've been watching it. But recently, it has moved from into Africa and Europe. It infects birds easily, but does not affect people easily. So when it, so we do have that problem. Next, and there's lots of factors why we had this problem in Asia, and there's some cultural things there that make it more susceptible. First of all, in Asia, there's more people and, 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 and birds living together, okay? Crowded cities, they have uh, poultry being an asset, they're very guarded, you may have tenant houses where you have bird coops on the roofs, you may have people living with it, very close proximity to the people. Next thing is there are a lot of unsanitary conditions. So you're putting stress on the people, stress on the birds. They have huge live bird markets, or they call them wet markets, which are a prim primary source of poultry in those cities, where they have live birds, different types of birds, all being housed in these live bird markets. You either pick the bird up and take it home to kill, or they kill it there in the street for you. We also have a lot of poor countries, and they're impoverished people. And if you can imagine one of your uh, assets is your poultry, if you see a bird that is not acting normal, what do you do? You don't throw it away. It becomes tomorrow's supper. They eat the, the sick birds. And there's a lot of cultural uh, effect where there's some consumption of uncooked meat and, and, and poultry, especially raw blood, which has caused some of the infections. And they also have a very large cockfighting uh, aspect of their culture. And cockfighting is one where you have close interaction of people, blood, and the birds. And it's a highly mobile population in that, in that arena. Other things that are not there is that it's not a subtle disease in birds. When you have H5N1, you know it. It kills birds very quickly and in large numbers, sometimes as high as 90%. With few exceptions, the cases have been in live markets, free-roaming birds, or wild birds, or, ke or birds kept in primitive conditions. We don't see it in the commercial industry like we have in the United States. The biggest flocks you see in some of these areas is 1,000 or 2,000 birds that people keep. So it's a different type of industry, different type of structure. With that, if you're keeping small groups of birds, you have a lot more people-bird interaction, a lot of more manual labor on the feeding and the watering, more contact with the people and the birds. One of the things that's happened this year, in the last couple of months, is there's been a lot of press and a lot of, no, uh, 
uh, speculation that the avian influenza has been spreading because more countries started outbreaking with it. And there's been areas outside of Asia that's now starting to show some H5N1. One has been in the EU nations. Most of the outbreaks that have been reported in the last two months, three months in, in the EU have been single incidences in wild birds. Swans, tufted ducks. There's been a lot of no, a thing, you know, we just heard last week that there was a swan found in, Great, in Scotland. Well, that's a wild swan, it's a wild population, and most of these have occurred in single instances. There's been a lot of spe trying to figure out why all of a sudden the swans, about almost 80% of the cases in Europe have involved swans. And there's a couple things, biologically wise, if you think of a swan, their esophagus, their trachea is about three feet long. So once a virus gets down there, it's hard to get out. So it's probably never been a, uh, had anything like that before. But another thing that happened this year, and people don't realize, is there was a record cold snap in Eastern Europe. And this may have disrupted the normal wintering nests. So either birds that already had H5N1 went to new nesting in, e in Western Europe, or birds that were infected that would have uh, been in that Eastern Europe have gone to other countries. So there was a shift of migration pattern of the birds because of this cold snap. That cold snap happened about a month before all these outbreaks occurred. So that's a, there's some speculation that that's why you're seeing this for the first time. People also ask why swans. Well, one of the speculations is if you see a big white bird laying there, you recognize it. If you see a little brown duck in a marsh, you probably don't see it. So it's more visible. There have been some outbreaks in poultry in the EU. There's been three recent outbreaks in poultry, one in France and Turkey, one in uh, Germany, which had a mixed farm of turkeys, geese, and uh, chickens, and one in Sweden, which was a game bird farm that had uh, uh, mallard ducks and pheasants on it. So we've had some outbreaks in poultry, but again, these were also countries that had outbreaks in or uh, incidences with wild birds. EU has done some things. One of the things it did is it had approved vaccination for birds in France and Netherlands. They do have approval to use in affected areas of vaccination program. And what I'll talk a little bit about is why we don't vaccinate birds in the United States. Well, one of the problems is as soon as you vaccinate for birds for uh, a disease, you no longer have those birds as sentinels. So as part of the EU requirements, anytime a flock is vaccinated, they have to leave a certain number of unvaccinated birds on that farm to act as sentinels to see if that disease occurred there. The reason France and Netherlands have done it, those are two of the major poultry producing state uh, countries in the EU, and there's a lot of outside poultry production, free range, a lot of uh, pasture poultry out there. And one of the things that EU has, a, has required is that the birds be moved in, inside. Well, they were not able to move all their birds, so they went to the EU to get approval to use that vaccination. Well, as soon as they used the vaccination, the first thing that happened is we have embargoes on all France and uh, Netherlands poultry industry. And they also require that in any affected area, the birds are moved inside to limit that contact of wild birds to the domestic birds. We've also seen some Middle East uh, Israel, Egypt, uh, Palestine has uh, been uh, affected. It's been in wild birds and poultry. This again could be a, a change in migrate, mig migratory routes that brought the disease into those countries due to the, the cold snap or the change in weather. One of the sad things that's happening in Egypt, because they didn't have an indemnity program, and they were having this disease, people were hiding the sick birds. 
or hiding their poultry. And a couple, a few of the deaths that have been associated with H5N1 in Egypt has been due to people hiding that bird and it's led to human illness. We've seen some in Africa. Most of that has been in small village flocks, small little uh, uh, populations of birds, and we really don't understand where that one came from yet, whether it's been smuggled birds that went into the country or if there's some migra migratory changes. So what do you need to know about Asian bird flu? First of all, I can assure you the disease will not sneak up on the United States. Okay, the U.S. commercial poultry industry are structured so that it's at a lower risk than, say, the uh, uh, European uh, common market because the birds are kept inside and they have, that's a lower risk than free-ranging birds. What poses a risk is when we start having interaction of wild birds with other birds. So you have wild birds, free-range poultry, backyard birds, those live bird markets in New York, those gang cocks or those fighting cocks are all a high risk of all avian flu. So if there are any type of avian flu, they're risk, so H5N1 will be no different. And the companies really do understand that this is just not another AI and they're taking very good precautions with it. So what precautions are they taking? Next. How are they responding? Well, all of the major poultry companies are testing all flocks prior to processing to ensure the product is free of AI. This program started at the beginning of the year. Every flock, every farm that's sent to the processing period, uh, uh, processing plant, samples are taken at, within 14 days of processing. You saw that the incubation period is 14. So every flock is being monitored right now. In an event there is an AI infected flock, it will not go into human consumption. It will not be processed for food. It will be euthanized on farm and disposed of. And one of the other things that they're working on in the industry is to do a consumer education period. The worst thing that's happening is that we have a knee-jerk response to uh, avian influenza. Even in educated countries, when they hear avian influenza, they stop eating chickens. Well, most in those countries, that's a major part of their diets, or it's a major part of, of rural income. So you don't want that need, uh, unnecessary knee-jerk reaction. So the consumer needs to be educated about the safety of the poultry products. This mandatory surveillance programs have been done. It's, most of the, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a must test for exports, even though it's voluntary. They have mandatory surveillance of live bird markets now in New York, New Jersey, and the East Coast. There's been an increased awareness of public health officials and poultry health officials and state officials. So they're aware of this and they're more aware of watching what's going on. We've had increased information to small flock producers and there's an import ban on poultry from Asia, now from France, Turkey, and all the other countries that are having outbreaks. What's being done in Kentucky in regards to how agriculture or how the poultry industry is done? One, we have that commercial surveillance program. We have 100% participation of all the companies that are processing poultry on doing that surveillance. In the last year and a half, uh, a poultry health advisory board was created with uh, people from the state, people from the university, people from the diagnostic lab, and representatives of all of the poultry companies and they, uh, or their veterinarians so that they are aware of what's going on and they have created, and as part of that, they created an emergency disease plan for poultry so that we have a plan in place that if something happens, or if something happens in a, in a neighboring state, there are some guidelines of what should be done 
in regards to movement of birds, movement of people, movement of equipment. Last October, we had some catastrophic loss training for the poultry industry in which we were part of a national program and learned about what's involved if you do have a catastrophic loss. And here's an example of something, you know, you think about it as being AI, but we also deal with it in this area sometimes when we have uh, tornadoes or straight line winds and a house goes down. How do you deal with that loss? How do you deal with those birds? And that's part of that training is how do we deal with all those things? What do we need in place? And more importantly, is the commercial poultry industry has created an indemnity fund for small flocks. They've put a, a fund together of $102,000 that has a pool of money available so if there is ever a disease problem in a small poultry far, or farm or small poultry flock, there's money available that the state veterinarian can use to buy that flock and to destroy it. We had an experience in 2003 where we had some diseased birds uh, shipped into the state and we found there was not a lot we could do about it because there was not an estate indemnity fund. Well, the poultry industry in response to that created that indemnity fund. So that's a quick reaction to it. If there's a problem, uh, it can be identified and compensation could be uh, can be given out. We talked a little bit about how those poultry companies are structured to prevent disease. Well, first of all, the chickens are indoors and, prote and are protected from disease-carrying wild birds. In uh, most of the companies, they have a company representative that visits the farm weekly to evaluate the flock. Uh, the producers are in there every day and they can alert the company to any changes in the flock health status. And there's some biosecurity procedures that are in place to keep the disease out of those flocks. One of the things is that no unauthorized vehicles are permitted on a farm or authorized visitors are permitted on a farm. It's a closed operation. Most of the farms that are in there are at least going to use disposable or uh, uh, designated uh, boots, hair nets when visiting farms. They have disinfectant there for the footwear. They have water sanitation systems in place, chlorination systems, and all the farmers are told not to have contact with waterfowl, gamecocks, poultry swap meats, anywhere there's small flocks or other flocks that are not in the control of the company. The question always comes up, why we don't vaccinate for bird flu? Well, first of all, there is no vaccine for H5N1. There are vaccines for other, organ for other types of avian influenza. So, but historically, if you vaccinated for, H uh, for AI, it meant that the country, a country was not very serious about eradication. It's been always a disease we dealt with with eradication. The U.S. poultry industry relies heavily on embargo. And on, on exports, and we are, uh, they're very concerned about embargoes. And if you were to vaccinate your birds, there would be embargoes from different countries placed on you. Well, the way the, the, you, the consumer is, is set up, they like breast, white meat, breast meat, and that's used for the domestic par, uh, uh, markets, but the leg quarters go overseas. So we have a very large export market. 20 to 25% of the poultry is exported because People don't eat the, the, the dark meat here. Uh, trade barriers would be imposed if U.S. is vaccinated for AI. Overseas opposition to vaccines may be vanishing. As we see France and Netherlands starting to vaccinate, it's kind of hard for the other AEU countries to put a band on poultry that's from a vaccinated country. So we'll, we're seeing a little softening of this. The other question that comes up as we're dealing with health officials and, and people uh, in county levels is that we have lots of small producers. We have lots of backyard flocks, whether they keep them for meat or eggs or hobbies. And some of the things that they can do is one is biosecurity, is to close their facility to visitors and to keep their birds isolated from other birds. The second thing that a lot of you can help me with is personal hygiene. 
wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. They did a study by USDA where they interviewed commercial uh, small flock producers. 48% of the small flock producers said they did not wa require hand washing after handling the poultry. So if we can cut that in half, we're doing pretty good. Separate clothes and boots for the poultry operation. Wear different designated clothing and boots to it. Question always comes up about protective gear, you know, when you're handling poultry waste and things like that. Anytime you're creating an aerosol by stirring up manure or cleaning out a poultry house, you should be wearing protective gear. Whether it's a, a, a mask, goggles and gloves are always a good idea to use when you're creating that aerosol and you can you can breathe in or take care of that also people should be aware of where they've been when they go to different places that poultry are there we also want to get sick birds into a diagnostic lab closest one to here obviously is in hopkinsville with murray state's uh, breath of lab if they're sick birds they need to go through a local veterinarian, but get those birds looked at. And the other thing is, is that we have the veterinarians, uh, state veterinarian's office who has field staff out there, and there are requirements of health requirements for poultry shows, poultry events. So if there's a poultry event in your county, the state veterinarian's office should be known about it, whether it's a county poultry show, or it's a swap meet, or a, a flea market where they're selling chickens. If you call their office, they'll have somebody there that'll at least be another set of eyes available to look at those birds. With that, I'll close and we'll take questions later on as we get on our panel. Um, our next speaker, or actually introducing our next speaker, is another one of our many community partners. Uh, not a stranger to Marshall County by any stretch. Uh, Lori King is our Area One Manager for the Office of Emergency Management. I know most of you here, but my name is Lori King and I'm the Area One Manager for the Kentucky Division of Emergency Management. First of all, just want to thank you all for being here today. As a past employee of public health, I know how important uh, this planning is to public health and to the healthcare community as well as to the first response community. So I'm very excited to see all of you here today. I think that our area um, is to be commended for the great job we do at collaborating with one another and how well we all work together. And I think that just is a great testament to our area. So thank you for being here today. At this time, I'd like to introduce one of my counterparts. Um, his name is Rick Cox. He works the Area 3 um, area in uh, the Owensboro um, area of Kentucky. He's been with emergency management for 18 years and five months. I think he told me earlier today and counting. Um, he does a great job over in that area. He is a certified emergency manager, um, has worked a lot of events and disasters such as Hurricanes Katrina and Wilma, has worked the 9-11 disaster, and he's going to talk with us today about emergency management's role if we were to have a flu pandemic. So I'd like to introduce Rick Cox. Good afternoon. On behalf of uh, Clay Bailey, the Director of Kentucky Division of Emergency Management. I'd like to say that I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to see such a large crowd uh, as we go through uh, our discussion. What we're going to talk about is what's going to happen, and this is from the emergency management role, the direction and control aspect, in the event that we have a, uh, a major event. Now, one thing I need to tell you is that there are several acronyms in my presentation, and I'll try to identify what those acronyms mean to you so that uh, hopefully, you know, if you haven't heard them before, you'll know what they are. The first one is NIMS, N-I-M-S, stands for the National Incident Management System. I hope everybody here, and as I was watching the hands go up, knows what that means, because we, you and myself, all of us as responders, are going to use NIMS in the incident command system, uh, and it's not by choice. It's a mandate. Whenever we take and do certain things, we're required to use that as our management, one of our management tools. NIMS is a requirement from the federal level, Department of, of uh, Homeland Security. I, the incident command system, ICS, uh, that comes from something 
that has been around for some time, but it's part of our state law that was passed back in the late 90s uh, in 39A, uh, KRS 39A. That's part of our law, that whenever we respond. <clears throat> and we'll get to the question, who's in charge, in a few minutes. But when we stop and look at this, you know, who's in charge? It is a good question. Well, maybe it's public health. Now, I'm not a medical type person, but the health guys have needles. I know that. It, what about the police department? I do know that the police guys have guns. Sometimes that leads to some uh, management issues. Uh, the fire department, they're going to be there. They're going to be involved. See, now they've got a lot of people, and they have some people that do some medical things. Uh, military, you know, you've heard a lot of discussion about that. Maybe if the president uh, might have his way or, so, or some of his people say, you know, the military is going to play a major role. Who's in charge? We'll get to that in a minute. I tell you what I do, and that is when I look at what's going to happen, next slide, I go to what our role is in emergency management. Now, I, I did say KRS 39A. That stands for the Kentucky Revised Statute. That's our state law. And any time that I start getting involved in certain types of discussions, I go back to see what the law says. And I have a copy of my little part of it right here that I want to talk about. Just for your information, this is uh, KRS 39A.010, one of the first pieces of legislation in the book that deals with emergency management. Now, it is a little bit on the lengthy side, so I'm not going to read all of it, but I am going to read just a little bit of it verbatim. It says, it is the intent of the General Assembly to establish and to support a statewide comprehensive emergency management program for the Commonwealth and through it an integrated emergency management system in order to provide adequate uh, assessment and mitigation preparation, response, and recovery, and then it lists a whole cadre of different things that could happen. And then it sums up by saying, in order to protect life and property of the people of the Commonwealth, to protect public peace, health, safety, and welfare of the environment, and to ensure the continuity and effectiveness of government in times of emergency, disaster, or catastrophe. Our state law says it very specifically. You know, it's the intent of the General Assembly for certain things to be done. And that's part of the emergency manager's role. We talk about a comprehensive emergency management program through an integrated emergency management system that talks about the four phases of emergency management, preparation, response, and recovery. So we can protect the life and protect the property of that of the Commonwealth but to ensure continuity of government. Sometimes people seem to forget what government is here for. Government is here to be a service to the public. Let's go to the next one. So the question is, how are we going to do this? It's very simple. It's not any great big secret. It's nothing new. Uh, in our job, we plan and we respond to all hazards. We plan and we respond to all hazards. It may be the flood event. It may be the snowstorm or the ice storm event. It may be the tornado. We all have dealt with that at one time or another. It may be something like Y2K. If you remember that, uh, in, in the latter part of 1999, the big fear that our computers were going to crash, our systems were going to go down, and we were going to be in the Stone Age or something similar. Things were not going to work. Y2K, we did a lot of things to get ready for that. That's a prime example of being prepared. That's very simply put, things that we do. And this is what we do in incident command, or excuse me, in, in, in emergency management. Now, we talk about ICS here, which is the incident command system. This is where we take the law, this is where we take the plans and put them together and we come up with our response system, all right? Don't want to get it too difficult. Uh, it's our job to bring all of those players together. And I just put up a little bit of simple of an organizational chart. Uh, we develop that organizational chart that we need to match the type of incident that we've got to work. 
Something new that we're dealing with is unified command. Now, in some places this is new, uh, other places it's not. Next. When we talk about unified command, this is what, something we've been doing for years in the Commonwealth. We work together. It's nothing new. I want to give you an example of uh, what, we talk, what I'm talking about. And I know this is a little bit on the dated side, but it's a prime example. In 1994, I was on a August, uh, August, I forget exactly which the date was, but it was a Sunday morning. The phone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning, says, hey, Rick, uh, they're out of water in Owensboro. I said, okay. I said, who'd you get the call from? They said it was the Owensboro Municipal Utility System, their, their water uh, utility. I said, okay, and he gave me the details. I turned around and called the county director. I said, hey, uh, I think you're out of water. He says, no, I'm not. They haven't called me. I said, I think you're out of water. I just got the call. You need to do certain things. Owensboro Municipal Utilities lost about a 24-inch water line about six feet outside of their building. And it was the major water line that supplied not only the city of Owensboro and Davis County, but they also sold water from that system out to several other counties. So it wasn't just one little city. It was several things. <clears throat> well, I told Richards that you need to call your staff in and get them to the emergency operations center. I'll be there in driving time. Now, I happen to live about 27 miles away in a little town called Hallsville. We have our own water system there. So I was able to take a quick shower because I knew what I was going up against, and I fixed a uh, pot of coffee and took a cup with me. Uh, when I got there, I realized I was probably the best smelling person, and I was the only one that had fresh coffee. On the way in, I stopped at the water treatment plant and talked to the uh, manager of the water utility named Bob Carper. He made a comment to me. He says, Rick, he says, I sell water. I don't handle emergencies. I said, fine. I don't do anything with water but drink it and swim in it. I'll take care of the emergency side. You make sure you have someone at the emergency operations center at 8.30 for a press conference. Now, mind you, this is about 2.30 in the morning or so. Staff started rolling in. 2.30 in the sun, on a Sunday morning, staff starts rolling in. Uh, a lady who has since retired from the uh, health department, the district health there in, in the Owensboro area named Lamont Mayfield, uh, she comes wandering in and, and she wonders, why am I here? I said, I hate coming to these. Last time I came to one of these things, I stood around and didn't have any assignment. The county and city fire chiefs were there. Something very interesting happened, and, and I got an education that day. I, I, know, I know how to help coordinate and make things work, but I had an education that day. Very simply put, if you can't flush, you can't serve food. Okay, if you can't flush, you can't serve food. So the health department made that statement in so many words and issued in an order that shut every restaurant in the city of Owensboro on a Sunday morning. Just think about that. The city and county fire chiefs gave it some thought and said, if you don't have water in your sprinkler heads, you can't occupy the building because there's no fire protection. If you, can't, if you don't have water in the sprinkler heads, you cannot occupy the building. So they shut down the Walmart, the Kmart, the Kroger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera on a Sunday morning. So when everybody wakes up, turns on their faucet, tries to fix their, cup, their pot of coffee, and they have no water, well, they will go to a restaurant to get water, right? No, because the health department just closed those down because if you can't flush, you can't serve. So they say, well, I'll go to Walmart and buy a gallon of water. Walmart very quickly said, if we can't open up, what can we do? They said, well, you can put the registers outside. Just don't let the population, the public, into your building. Employees, OK. Uh, the rest of the people, no. So they were hustling water out the front door to the cash register in the parking lot selling water, selling igloo containers, anything that would hold water. We all work together to make this work. If you look up there, it says strategy for one IAP. Go to the next slide, that's an incident action plan. 
For those of you who have completed your ICS training, ICS 200, ICS uh, 100, and a little bit of the NIMS training, you may have heard of something called an IAP, an Incident Action Plan. This is where we talk about the objectives of what we're going to do, who's going to do what and how and so forth. When we started working, we started coordinating certain things. This is what we're going to do. How do we coordinate these events? Closing of transportation routes. Now, some of the parts that some people haven't told yet is if there is an event, it'll probably be one that shuts down a lot of things. The example would be shutting down transportation or people coming in because we don't want people in. We want to keep things confined. It may be setting up shelters because they can't stay at home by themselves because they have to have people come in and help take care of them. So we're going to bring maybe those people together uh, so that we can take care of them. Warehousing of different things that we may need. The security issues. Uh, something called joint information. We may be working on these. What all of this means is coordination. Emergency management is going to provide emergency operation centers, the EOCs. This is where your policy makers make policy for that incident. Your county judges, your city mayors, city managers, fiscal court members, city council, city commissioners, those type of people, your CEOs, this is where they're going to make policy and then this is where your emergency management director and the EOC staff carry out the policy. The emergency manager carries out the policy with the EOC staff when they start working the coordination, the communications and so forth. Very simply put, all right, and we start collecting this information, doing some analysis and then we take and do some dissemination. Now you heard me say joint information systems. Again, this is a new requirement. This is something that comes up in NIMS that we had not seen before. The key thing here is, again, coordination. If you look and see that word. Dr. Humbaugh uh, ma made a comment about getting the same message out to all the partners and all the participants. The Joint Information Center is where we start bringing all of our public information officers together and we start sharing that information to the public. Let me give you a prime example. In a major snowstorm, you know what happens? The phone lines to the police department and law enforcement agencies get clogged with people wanting to know, you know, besides saying they've had wrecks here and there, but they want to know, are the roads open? Can I get out? And the dispatchers in the law enforcement agencies will say, no, the roads are closed, are not closed, they're dangerous, you need to stay home and, and don't get out. All right, they're trying to cut down on the amount of incidents occurring. What happens when you call over to the county road department or the state highway garage, or you're talking to their public information officers? They say, yes, we've had our crews out since whenever, they've been spreading salt, they've been spreading sand, they've been pushing the snow. Yeah, we're out doing our job making the roads passable. So on one hand, we have dispatchers saying, no, stay home, the roads are dangerous. On the other hand, you have the highway people saying, we're out there doing our job, getting the roads cleared off. They're both saying the, the right thing, but the wrong thing. Joint information centers is bringing those together to say the right message, all right? To say the right message. I think uh, uh, our previous speaker kind of summed it up when he said, uh, it helps prevent maybe some of that knee-jerk reaction. You know how, how we'll get the story from one aspect and then we'll get this second story. Well, let's get the right story out. And that's what a joint information center is all about. So let's go to the original question, who's in charge? I want you to look at uh, second line, last word, coordinate. It's that word again. The chief elected official in the jurisdiction has selected an emergency manager to coordinate the jurisdiction's response. That's a given. That's your county emergency manager who works with your county, or excuse me, with your area manager who works with the director of emergency management in Frankfurt. Emergency management has that responsibility and it's carried out through coordinating 
That's that big word that we use, coordinating with public health, Department of Agriculture, and other agencies. That's the part that we do. Now, we don't do this, you know, day in, day out on every little rinky-dink thing that happens. We're talking about, in this particular case, on a pandemic event, when we ask who's in charge. It's very, very simply put, when I asked my boss about this uh, a couple months ago, he said, Rick, he says, we don't want to use that word in charge if we can help it, because we coordinate. You know, we get whatever public health says they need. We get whatever agriculture says they need. If, law, if the state police have certain requirements, we get what they need. What we do at the state level is what happens at the local level as well. In summing this up, you kind of need to know something. This is sort of a motto that I've kind of learned to live by. Failure to plan on your behalf doesn't automatically make it an emergency on my behalf. I'm here to tell you, Lori has eight counties here. I've got seven in my area. And there'll be some people to call me up, or there'll be people to call her up, and they'll be real excited, and they'll wonder, what are they supposed to do? How are they going to do this? And when are they going to do it? Our job is to coordinate. All right, our job is to coordinate. And if your agency, your department, your people did not, make, did not make the necessary plans, I'm sorry, but we'll take and help you through it. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I promised earlier we'd be done at 5 o'clock. I'm probably going to have to fib just a little bit. We're, going, we're editing a little bit on the fly here, so we will probably uh, shorten the panel discussion, but there is one other presentation we would like for you to uh, listen to today, and that's uh, from our regional epidemiologist for the Purchase Region, uh, Mr. Ariel Sarmiento, who will talk about hospital and health department surveillance. Ariel? Thank you, Charlie. Uh, good afternoon. I'll, I'll really make this as uh, squeak as possible. We only have one slide here. My name is Ariel Sarmiento. I am the epidemiologist for the uh, Purchase District Health Department, and I also serve the Marshall County Health Department. So um, I am the Region 1 epidemiologist. Um, epidemiologist. Uh, there is one concept that we really need to discuss uh, in terms of uh, pandemic planning, but we have an infrastructure called public health surveillance, and that is the system, how we find out whether there is a communicable disease, either infectious or not, that is going on in the community. And we all know that influenza is a communicable disease. Uh, the government needs to find out about it, and there are, uh, there are systems on how to report. Uh, it is mandated by law, uh, but there is also a desk reference on how clinicians and hospitals uh, report diseases and I would like to emphasize that it's really a, uh, the hospitals are a major player in this effort but doctors offices are a key player uh, are key players as well so this is the infrastructure that we have uh, doctors offices or hospitals through emergency rooms will first see the cases now influenza is a reportable disease but it is only reportable if it is culture confirmed. Uh, so there are two types of detecting influenza that would be a rapid test and a culture confirmation. A, culture, uh, a rapid test is very helpful for clinicians, however, it doesn't make the case definition, so we don't really find out about it because they are not required by law to report it since it did not meet case definition. So we are encouraging doctor's offices to go the extra mile by collecting specimens to have a culture uh, confirmed cases so that we'll find out what is really going, out, going on out there and what strains we have. Um, that is basically the infrastructure that we have uh, as far, and that's the system that we have in place throughout the entire state of Kentucky. And that is how we find out uh, whatever is, is going on. So that's the flow chart. Eventually it goes to the state, but it first passes through the local health departments.
Thank you.